uh, it's 10 a.m. and we can call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, hearing of uh, March 29th, 2023. Um, today we have uh, the fiscal year 22 hospital hospital budget actuals um, that should be presented by Sarah Lindbergh, Flora Pagan, and Matt Sutter. Um, Matt and Flora are our health systems finance principal analysts here at the board. I think most folks are familiar with Ms. Lindbergh from her frequent appearances. And then after that, we'll have the um, fiscal year 24 hospital budget guidance and a potential vote. I'll turn it to our executive director, Ms. Barrett, for the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have one uh, ongoing public comment, which I uh, announce every week, but I will remind folks um, that we are accepting any public comments regarding a next all peer model with our federal partners at CMMI. Any of the comments we receive, we share with our colleagues at the Agency of Human Services and the governor's office as they are leading those negotiations and implementation of the current model. Um, today's, we, we have accepted public comment on the FY24 budget guidance, and those comments are posted on our website. And then last, we will have our schedule posted by the end of this week for the month of April. And I'll just remind folks who are not talking, if you could put yourselves on mute, I'm hearing a little background. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lindbergh, um, Flora and Matt, uh, take it away. Good morning. I will give Flora and Matt a chance to start sharing their slides. I'm really just here to make an introduction to two of the best people you'll ever meet. Um, so Matt and Flora are the real stars of the team, and I'm excited for you to get a chance to hear from them directly. So whenever you're ready, fellow, uh, my fellow colleagues. Hi, good morning. My name is Flora Pagan. I'm a, one of the financial analysts at the Green Mountain Care Board. Today, my colleague Matt Sutter and I will be presenting the FY22 actual report. Can you guys see the slides? Looks great, Flora, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are going to go um, quickly over the year end review, system wide analysis, the hospital profiles, an overall review of the budget to budget and actual to actual analysis, uh, key financial indicators, a five year result, um, possible enforcement, and we'll go over really quick about the appendix. So the year end review. So Vermont hospitals are required to report their fiscal year 2022 actual operating results as part of the Green Mountain Care Board's FY22 budget orders. Additionally, hospitals are required to submit their FY22 audited financial statements as well as the hospital's parent organization's audited consolidated financial statements if applicable. These documents um, and any other additional information are available at our website. So we're going to start here with our system wide analysis. So the NPR and FEP system wide, it was slightly over budget by 1.5%. This was largely due to increases in the ut utilization. Um, here we see in the operating margin. So the operating margin was um, negative. That was due to cost inflation, shortages of supplies and healthcare workforce. The, na the nationwide staffing challenges that we had during the pandemic have continued as we can see throughout um, the year 2022. Here we have our payer mix. The overall payer mix um, sit, um, trends largely the same with some relatively small increases to Medicare that we have is due to um, the agency of the population, um, the aging of the population and for Medicare was due to redetermination and that is planned to resume this spring. So the 2022 year end results for the NPR and FEP. So we saw um, a lot of the variances among the hospitals. However, even for hospitals with positive um, budget to actual NPR variance, we will see on the next slide that these gains were mostly offset by increased overall expenditures of supplies 
salaries, extra use of travelers with higher rates, and as well the French benefits. So here we have the operating margin results. So the operating margin results has been effect negatively. That was due to the safety net that was um, starting to be um, revealing, and that was because of the impact of financial um, of the impact of the financial pressures of the um, workforce issues that we had. Bottom line, the expenses are growing faster than revenue, and that has actually led to reduced margins. So we have here the bottom line total margins. The largest contribution to the reduced margins was actually the investment of performance. So the FY22 year end review for the fiscal perspective payments. The, there was a variance between hospitals, but the system wide um, FPP came in 2% higher than budgeted. Um, the physical year actual to actual growth system above ceiling. So here, um, the system above ceiling, there was a variance between hospitals, but the system wide actually came with 2% higher. Uh, we do have a comparing of the FY22 actuals to the maximum growth range in the all payer model. The system wide it was more than double from a 9.9% versus the 4.3% that we can see here. So the um, system overall above ceiling comparison for the um, past five years from 2017 to 2022. Here we're looking at a compounded growth in the NPR um, since FY27, 2017. Um, the system wide growth has been roughly equivalent to the maximum of the all payer model growth, which the range was from 4.29% versus the 4.3%. Our common financial highlights here. So hospitals are facing strong headwinds nationally due to the growth, um, the workforce challenges that we have, increased costs and capacity needs. The challenges are shared by Vermont hospitals. System wide, while the net patient revenue is almost 10% from the pr prior year and 1.5% uh, above the budget, um, the hospitals are still struggling due to the cost pressures. Um, in all of the narratives of the hospitals, we actually um reported um, significant pressures that was related to, as we know, the um, staffing, contract labor and salary and benefits, um, inflationary pressures, and as well, medical expenses. To, due to this imbalance between the operating revenue and expenses, hospital operating margins system-wide have been reduced by 80 million in FY21 and in FY22 by 61 million. Um, anything else from the um, narratives and this presentation, we can actually see it in the um, FY22 actual and the Green Mountain Care Board website. Now I'm going to leave you with my colleague, Matt Sutter, and he will go um, over a quick review for the hospital profiles. Thanks, Flora. Um, I'm just going to quickly walk through each of the hospitals and, and provide um, some quick points or things we noticed from their narratives related to revenues and expenses. Um, I apologize in advance. I think a lot of it's going to be uh, pretty repetitive. Um, I think that gets the point across um, pretty well. Um, so for Brattleboro, they had a slightly negative um, NPR actuals relative to their budget. Um, you With them, it was payer mix was mostly unfavorable, um, but this was m largely offset by utilization, dish, and bad debt and free care. On the expense side, and again, I apologize, I'm going to sound like a broken record, um, contract labor and inflationary pressures uh, were driving costs there. You can go to the next slide. And uh, for most of these, we saw we'll display the payer mix changes um, year to year. We didn't see broadly some, some we didn't see major changes uh, with one exception, um, which we'll get to, but um, just for your reference, we have these slides. Uh, for CM, uh, CVMC, uh, revenue was down relative to budget, 4.2. Uh, this was due to utilization and payer mix. Expenses were up 6% um, relative to budget, the largest driver here being staffing. And then um, the payer mix slide, kind of more of the same. Um, no major changes or continuation of trends here. Uh, Copley had... Uh, positive NPR relative to budget, but you'll see the operating expenses grew faster. Um, so the revenue was positive 
driven by utilization, and I think they had a favorable FPP uh, result. On the expense side, it was it grew faster relative due to um, contract staffing and other inflationary pressures. And then I mentioned that there was one of the pair mixes that were um, still validating, but we did see a, a sizable looks like sizable shift from commercial to Medicare um, for Copley. So we will we're investigating this and we'll get back to you. But just wanted to highlight that. Uh, for Gifford, it was their uh, positive revenues were mostly driven by a favorable cost report settlement in FPP, though they also had favorable utilization, uh, payer mix, bad debt, and free care. Um, and then the 10% increase in operating expenses due to inflationary pressures and staffing. And some movement here, but um, kind of in line with prior year. Grace Cottage had um, increased NPR relative to budget and increased operating expenses relative to budget. Um, on the revenue side, this was due to utilization on the expense um, contract staffing. And their pair mix kind of showing a uh, continuation of trends from the previous two years. Uh, Mount Escutney had positive NPR FPP relative to budget and positive operating expenses relative to budget. Um, kind of the same deal here. Revenues were driven by utilization. Um, Mount Escutney had a favorable cost report settlement, had an unfavorable payer mix, but as you can see, it was offset. Um, on the operating expense side, same um, as the other hospitals, driven by inflationary pressures and staffing. Uh, Mount Escutney also noted the volume was having um, kind of a negative effect on operating expenses. Um, just wanted to bring that up. And um, nothing jumping out on the payer mix side for them. For North Country, uh, revenues were revenues were a little bit different here. So they're kind of an unusual case. So they while utilization was up, they they had an unfavorable payer mix, but um, most importantly for them on the revenue side, as part of their EMR conversion, they had an audit adjustment to write down their um, net patient receivable, mostly affecting bad debt. Um, so as a result, their bad debt free care is about 5.9 million below budget. And you can see given the relative size of the hospital that um, had a major impact. And expenses were up 7.5% uh, to budget due to staffing costs. And there was some movement here of some shift from commercial to Medicare. For Northeastern, um, they had a positive NPR variance to budget due to utilization, um, mostly due to utilization, and they also, but they also had a favorable payer mix, um, bad debt and dish. On the expense side, it's a result of staffing and inflationary pressures, um, that 11% increase. And payer mix um, pretty similar. Northwestern's um, NPR variance was just under budget. They had favorable utilization, payer mix, dish, and FPP. Um, what was driving it down was, and it's not controlled for on this graph, but they had a um, provider transfer that um, reduced their NPR. So it's m basically was offset just looking at the, the raw variance there by their favorable utilization and, and payer mix. Um, if you control for the provider transfer, the NPR would have been just under um, 2% to the positive. Um, and on the expense side, it's driven by contract labor. Uh, pretty similar from last year, the payer mix. Uh, moving to Porter, um, they had positive NPR variance relative to budget due to utilization and um, reimbursement payer mix, um, but you know increased variance to, on their operating expense due to contract staffing and inflationary pressures.
and here it kind of kind of continuing trends from previous year, but it looks like a some shift from commercial to Medicare. Um, kind of same overall story with Rotland, 12.9% um, variance on their NPR relative to budget. Um, they reported this was due to a, largely due to a steep uptick in volume. Um, on the expense side, it's mostly driven by salary pressures and contract labor, but they also, like the other hospitals, reported significant inflationary pressures. And their pair mix is pretty similar to last year. For Southwestern, their um, higher NPR relative to budget was due to was mostly driven by payer mix um, and then operating expenses higher than budget uh, again due to staffing costs and inflationary pressure. Uh, pretty similar year to year for them, the payer mix side. Um, for Springfield, kind of their NPR variance was below budget, um, driven by utilization and payer mix and operating expenses above budget due to um, contract staffing costs and inflationary pressures. I do want to pause on this one just for a second because it might catch your eye that their revenues came in below budget, their expenses came in higher, but their operating margins are higher. Um, and that's uh, that's due to a they had a Five point nine million dollar favorable increase due to uh, federal and state grant funding, which is rolling in on the um, like other operating revenue line. So it's not showing up in patient revenue, but it will roll into that operating margin. Um, so that's what's accounting for that. They're um, pretty significant grants. On the payer mix side for Springfield, um, we saw a little bit higher commercial and reduced Medicare relative to last year. And finally, UVM, um, kind of continuing the same story as the other hospitals, revenues were slightly below NPR budget. Um, so while utilization was up, the pair mix was very unfavorable to UVM. Um, but they did have some offsetting factors, like favorable uh, bad debt, free care, DISH, and a um, sizable change to their graduate medical education which contribute reimbursement, um, which I believe contribute about $20 million. Uh, on the expense side, it's driven by contract staffing and inflationary pressures, which they largely identified as drug costs. And then um, paramix for UVMs kind of continuing trends we've seen over the past few years. And moving to the overall review, these are just some larger tables kind of Illustrating some of the stuff Flora spoke at the beginning with an extra couple years of information. So here's their five year NPR um, FPP for each hospital. Uh, and then if we move to the next slide, we can see that as a, a percentage basis change from the prior year. So you can see that massive jump we had in NPR last in FY21, likely a result of COVID, just you know, changes, but we're seeing um that trend for most hospitals continuing this year at a um, slightly reduced rate. On the operating expense side, um, I mean, just looking at the raw numbers, uh, it's over a $400 million increase from 21 to 22. And, you know, just eyeballing it, it, it took a $400 million increase is about what FY18 to FY21 was. So um, pretty rapid increases in operating costs over the last year. And then moving to the next slide, it just shows the same numbers on a year over year percentage basis. And you can, I think that illustrates it even more. Um, operating margins um, are five year results kind of telling the same story. I think we had this slide um, for three years up at the up start of the presentation, but um, just providing a little bit more history here. And then their margin. Um, as a percentage for the system total. Uh, total margins, which Floor mentioned, was um, greatly affected by, oh, sorry. Ah, my slides were slightly different. Uh, 
stays cash on hand. You can see, that, well, this is really the end result of everything we're talking about, right? Is it reduced operating margins? We're going to see reduced days cash on hand. And in 22, we saw a significant drop from the prior year. Um, so moving to enforcement. Uh, so Green Mountain Care, uh, we move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so Green Mountain Care Board may review hospitals whose year end NPR FEPs exceed the requirement by 1% above or below the approved um, amount. This review does not necessarily lead to action by the board, though. So the first step, we took a pass at you know, which hospitals trigger review, and it's all of them except for Brattleboro, Northwestern, and UVM. We're within that, you know, we're only looking at NPR here. So I know it's kind of um, just looking at just NPR triggering the threshold, UVM, Northwestern, and Brattleboro didn't trigger it. So moving to the next slide, we want to take a look at, you know, of those hospitals, what were their actual operating margins looking like for the year? And of these hospitals, we only saw three that showed um, operating margins above what they had budgeted. Um, so Gifford, Mount of Scutney, and Springfield. And moving to the next slide, we are not recommending enforcement for those three hospitals for the following reasons. Um, Gifford's NPR relative to budget is largely the result of an FPP attribution. They had 500 more lives than budgeted in a favorable cost report. Uh, without those two items, they were reported a negative net operating income. Mount of Scutney was similarly driven by a favorable cost report and FPP revenue. Um, coupled with that net operating revenue of just 61,000 over what they had budgeted. Staff's not recommending enforcement there either. And Springfield reported decreased NPR relative to budget, but positive operating revenues we discussed previously just due to those federal grants. So moving to the next slide, um, staff's not going to recommend enforcement for any of the hospitals this year. Um, just going down the list quickly, um, CVMC had a negative operating margin, so we don't recommend it for that reason. Copley, same deal. Uh, Gifford Medical Center, they had a, they explained on the previous slide their operating margin. Grace Cottage had a negative operating margin. Um, Mount of Scutney um, explained on the previous slide their operating margins. North Country, negative operating margin. Um, Northeastern, their operating margin was 87% lower. So even though they had a positive operating margin, it was 87% lower than what they had budgeted. Um, so not recommending enforcement for them. Northwestern didn't trigger review. Porter, um, similar to Northeastern, their operating margin, they did have a positive operating margin, but it was lower than budgeted. So not recommending enforcement. Rutland, uh, negative operating margin, so we're not recommending enforcement. Southwestern, same deal, negative operating margin and Springfield, their operating margin was explained in their narrative um, and on the previous slide. So um, for enforcement, I don't think we need a board motion if we're not recommending enforcement, but I did want to pause there if there were any questions about that. And seeing none, um, I don't think we need to I'll share just, the presentation. Sorry, yeah. I was waiting for Owen um, oh, sorry. <laughs> to ask if no we had questions. Um, sorry about that. So I, it would be helpful, I think, if you could explain a little bit about how the cost report works for the critical access hospital, particularly the settlement process and why that would, why that's connected to your recommendation. Um, and I would also just note that we didn't notice a vote on the agenda for this item. I, I I might have to ask Sarah to speak more about the cost report settlement. I'm kind of butting up against my limits of my knowledge here. Yeah, no problem. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, the parliamentary issue, yeah, we did not no notice a vote. If we are going to explore this further, we would clearly have another dedicated time to vote. Um, but just kind of want to introduce the staff recommendation at this point. Uh, as far as cost report settlements go, yeah, so it's... Um, 
Uh, there's these uh, really long cost reports that all hospitals have to submit. However, um, part of the deal in being a critical access hospital is that you are reimbursed based on a proportion of your Medicare allowable costs. And there's a very specific way that those values are derived. And so it's quite a guessing game to figure out where they might sugar out. And furthermore, um, you know, no one saw the expense growth coming. So, um, you know, just to to summarize that, you know, at a system level, budgets uh, as far as the NPR were up 1.5 percent, whereas the budgeted expenses were up 10.4 percent. So, you know, a 10 time delta on uh, the growth there. So, um, all that to say, the the favorable cost report has to do with unintended uh, unintended um, expenses, and there's also a bit of a sequencing issue where those settlements um, happen after the year is over and then you know look backward. And so you're booking revenue in an odd time that's not necessarily related to the year at hand. So um, does that help? Is that enough context? Great. Yes, I thought it just would be good to explain that. Um. Are there any other board comments or questions on the actuals? I just have a quick one. Um, I just want to, you know, we flew through the the payer mix slides um, pretty quickly. Um, and I just, you know, in, I noticed some troubling trends I think we've seen, but they're, they seem to be getting more troubling for some hospitals with the switch, uh, you know, drop in commercial and increase in Medicare. Quickly, I think it was Copley, Porter, I think maybe Gifford, um, might have been another one. And I'm just thinking that it might be helpful to do a system-wide look at some point on that, um, you know, what's happening to our payer mix and also try and understand what's happening to our payer mix a little bit more carefully, because I know some of them, the, you know, uh, Matt, you commented the trends are continuing, but if the trends continue for some of those hospitals, we're going to be in trouble, right? So I, I think I'm just thinking we need to do a deeper dive, I think, statewide and what's happening with payer mixes across hospitals. And some hospitals seem to be increasing their commercial, but it looked like through the quick look through that there's more of them that are seeing significant drops in, in commercial. And I think that's obviously going to be a problem as we think about sustainability uh, moving forward. Um, I just also want to just say I agree with the staff recommendation on enforcement for the reasons that were outlined. So thank you for that. And thank you for the presentation. Um, one, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, one thing that might be helpful when we're posting about days cash on hand is always for SVMC to have that asterisk with the parent because it looks really troubling for SVMC. I think if you pull up that slide, actually, could you pull up that slide? Because I had one other question. I think it was maybe slide 52. Yeah, so you know, SPMC is not in you know, thirty-seven days cash on hand is not a um, red flag yet. If we knew what the parent company days cash on hand, that would be helpful. So I think that just would be helpful to add to future slides. Always that asterisk with perhaps maybe in parentheses what the parent has. I think that would be helpful. But I did notice, and I wondered as I was looking at this slide, um, for most hospitals, the days cash on hand is is coming back to what it was pre-pandemic. Um, you know, I know we had these infusion of cash, federal dollars in 20 and 21, but for the most part, hospitals are coming back to, or frankly, below what they were in fiscal year 19. But the one exception, and I was just curious about, was Mount Escutney. So Mount Escutney was around 130, 140, got the big infusion of cash, but are still up there at 200. So I was just curious, since that was uh, unique, relative to the other hospitals, if anybody had insights into that, how they were maintaining the higher cash. Yeah, we can do a, a deeper dive on that one. Um, I, I do think part of it, um, I know that's not what their day's cash on hand is today, um, but we, we can- So do it just it. could be a timing of the reporting perhaps? Those cost reports, the way those get booked, um, also a lot has changed since fiscal year 22, unfortunately, um, for some of these uh, facilities. But yeah, um, we can get some more insight about that. That's great. I appreciate it. I think those are my, my jotted down notes. I think that's it for me. Thank you very much.
just to piggyback on uh, Jess's first comment, um, it would be kind of interesting to see if we can untangle, and this may not be possible, the how much is population aging and how much is Medicare Advantage versus, I don't know if there might be other factors in there too. Yeah, that's a really important point. I do think some of this mischief and payer mix has to do with inconsistent booking of Medicare Advantage, so we're working on getting that cleaned up as well. Thanks. And I, I'll just say I'm also uh, comfortable with the staff recommendation. Any other board member questions or comments? Yeah, I just um, I, I had a few questions about the pair mix as well, which I think we kind of may somewhat have touched on. But just one one quick question when looking at the pair mix slides, is that by uh, Patients are the percentages percentages of patients or percentages of revenue? Dollars. Um, okay. Yeah, we're yeah, and we're you know we only showed the net uh, payer mix. It looks a lot different, gross. Um, so we're working on trying to kind of develop some clear visualizations about that. Um, also, notably, uh, historically, well, we go back and forth on this, but. Uh, there are years where we put DISH in with Medicaid. This year it's kind of um, omitted. Um, we just need to figure out how to account for some of these other payment mechanisms and uh, figure all that out, but yeah. Okay. And then the other question I had on that, um, and I think you kind of touched on this, is is how is Medicare Advantage, how, wh where are the Medicare Advantage plans in here? I guess are some hospitals reporting this as commercial and some reporting as Medicare, or is there... Yeah, it's tricky. They are a bit of a hybrid product for hospitals to deal with. So they're administered by commercial plans. So some keep it there, but obviously the rates are tied to Medicare. So that's probably the more sensical place to try to book it. So, um, you know, in those cases, you know, I think we should do our, do a better job of trying to isolate it, especially with the recent increases in the penetration rate in Vermont. <clears throat> and then the other topic related to this that I think, you know, when we Look at this deep dive and try and understand this is maybe how the this Medicaid reattribution and potentially either a shift to uh, uncompensated care or commercial insurance is going to affect all of this over the next year or so. Um, the only the one other question I was going to ask is Matt, can can you re-explain what you were talking about with North Country and the free care bad debt impact on their actuals? I I wasn't quite able to follow that. Yeah, so as part of their EMR conversion, they had to make an audit adjustment um, in their net patient receivable um, for, yeah, I think it was affected bad debt. Um, so basically, I, I probably being imprecise with my language here, but they basically had to write off $6 million. Um, Sarah, correct me if I'm really mistaking that. But yeah, no, that's uh, and effectively uh, what yeah. <laughs> so uh, they essentially some outstanding funds were determined to be unrecoverable in their audit, and so it's five million dollars they were expecting to have a chance to collect that um, the audit found is not uh, appropriate, and so that is a huge uh, material shift for them, and the cash flow issues are indeed driven by the implementation of uh, their uh, EMR, and uh, I think. Those cash flow issues are really common. I've heard um, the EMR they're implementing can be one of the most difficult um, on that front. Meaning that the EMR isn't getting the revenue capture or charges that they would expect? Yeah, like these systems are intimately uh, embedded in billing infrastructure and uh, they were having a hard time getting it to work in some practices and uh, they're working their tails off uh, to get it going. But um, yeah, it's... So, it's, it's a tough one. So in that regards, are we expecting this $5 million to be a one-time hit, but also that as the EMR gets, I, I would assume they would be able to still recapture billing uh, charges. So maybe they would end up having some revenue capture in this fiscal year that is for care. Yeah, I, yeah as I understand it, that ship sailed um, and that this is determined to be unrecoverable. <laughs> Oh, oh, so that's the five million. Okay, and that, but that should be a one-time, and hopefully they're able to 
capture that moving forward. Yeah, it, it's a very rough start for fiscal year 23 at North Country. <clears throat> I, they're not alone in that statement, but um, that that was an unexpected last minute uh, adjustment that is pretty material for them. Okay. And then the one last question I have, which um, I don't know if this if we have this information through this data set or if you have insight into it, but um, it sounds like contract labor, I mean, we all know that contract labor is this huge impact in budgets right now. And so, but do we have an idea of the variance in that impacts sort of proportionally to other labor costs within hospitals or other nursing costs or, or whatnot by hospital? And if, if, if this is an equal impact to all hospitals across the state, because we're kind of saying contract labor for each one, but is this an equal impact or are there differing impacts at different hospitals? I'd say there's variation in the um, number of travelers uh, that institutions uh, are currently using. Um, we're trying to get a better sense in our uh, data model of isolating those expenses in a systematic way, but uh, right now it's not easy to do. So, um, but I'd say um, it, it came up, I think, in every single narrative, um, if I am remembering correctly. But I, I would think so. I just. You know, some institutions are big, some are small. So, you know, really it's trying to understand these proportions of the workforce that are contract labor and and trying to, I mean, and maybe that makes some sense in institutions to have more contract labor and others have less, uh, you know, because the <clears throat> whatever costs are associated, but it would be, I think, interesting to try to understand that dynamic. Yeah, and, and um, some hospitals have a little bit more flexibility in terms of leveraging um, immigration to try to fill some of these roles and uh, the route there. However, um, often those placements also take longer to actually fill, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. But yeah, I think that we we also share your uh, desire for a little bit more uh, nuanced understanding of these dynamics. And you know, I mean, and, and again, this is just my perspective working over the last couple of years is that the and where I could think that that lo the long t you know one of the advantage of contract labor is that you know there's been a lot of variance in the volumes and so if you can time it right and get your contract labor in when your volume is high it, it's it's reasonable but if you're if you get it wrong and the contract labor comes when your volume's low and you and you start you know initiating the process when the volume high then you got labor when you don't need it um so anyways that's that I don't I don't know how we think of I don't know what we have to do with that, but it, it's just an interesting observation, I think. But all right. Thanks. I, I I I support the staff recommendation as well. Thank you. Uh, this is Tom. Thank you uh for the background. <clears throat> and I don't have I have no trouble supporting the staff recommendation either. Um, thank you, Sarah, Matt, and Flora very much. This was insightful and it gives us a good sense of where things are. Um, I support the staff recommendation. I don't think enforcement would be appropriate in this environment, and I have no other comments. Um, I'll turn it to Healthcare Advocate. Good morning, everyone. Um, Sam Pysh, Healthcare Advocate. Um, usually to introduce myself, but I feel like I should do that so people know who I am. Um, we don't have any comments. I'm still digesting a lot of this. Um, a lot of the actual. So thanks, Sarah, Matt, and Flora for that. And yeah, we support the um, staff recommendation. I think it makes sense. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the main thought I have is just how this Im impacts the guidance. And I know we're talking about that next. So if I have questions or comments there, I'll ask it then. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Sam. And I'll turn it to public comment via the raise your hand. Mike Del Treco, quick on the trigger. Go ahead. Uh, I Thank you. Uh, are just you, wanted are you to, raising uh, your hand for the next one or for this one? This this one, Chair Foster. Uh, just want to thank the uh, staff, um, Sarah, her team, for a really comprehensive review. There's a lot of things moving here, um, and you know, clearly um, appreciate sort of your lens on the pressures we're facing. So th thanks, um, thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comment? Great. Um, well, thank you everyone um, for, for your presentation today. It was very helpful. And um, 
Ms. Lindbergh, I feel like you're up every time I'm doing a board hearing these days. So you're up again. All right, are the slides coming through for you? Wonder bar. Yeah. All right, so here we are. 24 guidance. Um, before we kick in, just uh, always uh, try to make sure that while we have a lot of difficult problems to untangle, taking time to recognize some some really, I, I think, notable work. And one that stands out to me is that despite all these challenges that the um, you know compounding annual growth rate in NPR from 2017 to 2022 is 4.3%, um, which is our goal. Um, that's impressive uh, to be constraining that growth, um, but expenses in that same time grew 6.8%. So I think some of that pressure is bubbling up, not just in Vermont, but uh, anyway, uh, very concerning to see those 22 actuals. So Sarah Lindbergh, Director of Health Systems Finance, here to talk about the draft guidance for fiscal year 24. Always a treat to be dealing with three fiscal years at the same time. So we closed out 22 or are in the process of that. 23 is underway. Um, hard to say how that's all going to sugar out. And now we're thinking about fiscal year 24. So we'll take a minute to recap what we've talked about so far review a few of the final proposed factors that we're recommending, the ratio of bad debt to free care, financial indicators, and known pricing changes for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, take a minute to discuss um, some potential um, opportunities to change the way we do hearings and deliberations. Uh, take a moment to actually walk through the guidance in its entirety at a high level. Um, and then we're proposing a set of uh, four motions uh, as decision points, one related to the benchmark, one related to the factors and the affiliated data sources, uh, one to adopt the required budget policies, and then finally an overall approval of the guidance. So uh, speaking of broken records, we're seeing fiscal year 24 as a bridge <laughs> between the way we've been doing things for 40 odd years and how we're kind of hoping to do things in the future. Uh, we talked about different ways to kind of uh, cross that bridge, um, but after feedback, uh, we decided that it would be preferable to stick with the traditional benchmark of net patient service re re revenue in this bridge year. Um, and the idea would be that factors associated with expense growth and commercial price growth would be assessed for each proposed budget, including the data that we mentioned, and that hospitals would just indicate how these factors were um, accounted for in their budgets. Um, and they don't need to necessarily tie to the same data. We just need to understand the assumptions they use to build their budgets. Um, as I've said a million times, I feel like to a million people, uh, the work isn't going to stop uh, March 31st, we're just going to keep plugging away to um, get some of this uh, underway for uh, implementation in fiscal year 25. So some non-exhaustive examples of areas we're still working is trying to figure out how to incorporate quality more directly in the hospital budget review. Um, and staff are recommending that we continue to develop that quality framework um, and think about how those outcomes can both be monitored, but also directly um, incorporated in a hospital budget process. Um, productivity, we have kind of a start on a few measures, but we would like to see some um, more um, sophisticated uh, work in that area that's going to rely heavily on um, data constraints. So we're still sorting through some of that and making sure we not only can develop measures, but think about balanced measures so that we're not over incentivizing something to hopefully um, mitigate any perverse incentives. Um, as far as patient access, uh, we have, uh, it was uh, suggested that we use the question that was used last year uh, related to referral and uh, scheduling wet, uh, leg. And, and in the case for hospitals unable to do that, provide the third next available. Um, we think that this needs a ton of work and, and we really as, a, as an organization should have a compre comprehensive look at access um, that doesn't leave out people who don't go to get seen at all. So we really need to kind of think about that on a population level and there will be components of that that may be relevant to hospital budgets, but it's a much bigger um, issue in my mind than one regulatory process. 
Um, equity is also another uh, critical issue. So there's uh, many measures that are being uh, proposed, uh, both by CMS and in other places. So we think that um, I, that's critical to system monitoring. Again, figuring out the piece that's relevant for hospital budgets um, is, is just a a piece of that work, but we just should be monitoring that as a regulator um, system wide. Um, in my judgment, I would make the same plug for consumer affordability. Um, that's a very difficult component to isolate um, just for hospital budgets, but it's a, also a critical part of the board's mission. So determining how we measure that in a systematic way and can apply that across our regulatory work, I think is, is another really important piece of our Oh, punch list makes me tired to think about all this in a good way. It's exciting, but <laughs> um, and then for per capita budgeting, um, I think that uh, this also is a, a, um, a statutory obligation that we have to uh, work on fulfilling and uh, that has, I think, a lot of um, cross pollination with efforts um, in kind of the technical advisory group and other payment reform initiatives. So um, we're trying to tie work in that area to that work stream. But um, just want to make sure everyone knows there's plenty on our radar on this is not meant to be like where we're going to um, land <laughs> for uh, forever, but it's again a bridge year and there's lots of work that's still uh, ongoing. So uncompensated care. <clears throat> Uh, this is uh, a, a tricky, tricky one. <laughs> uh, so the healthcare advo advocate uh, recommends assessing the ratio of bad debt to free care as a measure of operational effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, in last year's comments, they suggested that the board might consider uh, building to a, a specified ratio, such as moving to a one-to-one -one ratio by fiscal year 25. Um, the kind of, uh, I think they acknowledge Clearly, that you know, this wouldn't be a typical kind of uh, fiscal analysis in this space, and so we're still um, kind of trying to understand the evidence and make sure that we're, um, you know, producing this information in a way that the evidence suggests will be uh, meaningful. Um, so I think that 424, uh, we're that staff will be happy to perform this analysis um, and continue to re review that evidence, but. There's a lot that happened in the Medicare cost reports uh, in 22 related to trying to capture the cost of uncompensated care. And so I think that I, I personally think that that might be um, more where we want to try to dig um, instead of using kind of more of an accounting measure related to charges um, that's designed to get at kind of the cost of the care um, versus the charge master amount of the care that was delivered without being compensated. So, um, so it, I, I it basically it's a factor that I think should be considered, um, but uh, I'm not prepared to recommend necessarily setting a target or any other um, ratio um, to move towards for fiscal year 24. Um, uh, as far as financial indicators, so um, as you just saw, uh, Vermont's hospitals are in really uh, rough shape by and large, and that's not unique to Vermont. So. Um, given that we believe that relative indicators are, are probably what are going to be most important um, for this year, but uh, we do want to continue to develop some standard metrics to assess financial health uh, for fiscal year 25. Um, some challenges there are just like um, figuring out how to <clears throat> do those in a way that's flexible enough to account for the different um, financing situations of different hospitals. So, you know, if you are largely designed to be reimbursed based on costs from Medicare, you know, maybe these ratios look a little different than a PPS hospital. Um, that's the type of thing we really need. I, I, I want to make sure we have a sufficient input to make sure that um, objective benchmarks are appropriate um, and customizes it appropriately. So at, at any rate, um, places where we'll be able to get a sense of relative indi indicators and how they're being assessed. Um, so the rating agencies, the big three are Fitch, Moody's, S&P. Uh, we do have a subscription to Fitch. Um, it seems like we can find um, some of these others in publicly available sources, um, but may consider moving, uh, you know, figuring out what subscriptions are necessary to get the full tool set of objective uh, or relative benchmarks from them. Um, National Flash Reports are uh, mostly a convenient data source. It's uh, one of the fastest ways that we can kind of get a sense of how hospitals are doing that's built on um, some uh, a, a, you know third party proprietary tool but they release this high level stuff um, even though it's really current it'll change a lot month to month so we just need to keep in mind that um, you know no no source of truth is perfect uh, for any of this. Uh, we also, for the critical access hospitals, both the Flex Monitoring Team and the SHEP Center um, have some indicators that we will track. 
Um, and then we can also, um, this is, you know, really only backward facing, but we can look at Medicare cost reports to get a sense of um, standard kind of historical benchmarks uh, for our hospitals um, compared to uh, peer groups, similarly situated hospitals. Um, so the kind of key staff will be looking at many indicators, but the kind of key ones that we recommend focusing on for the board review are, um, you know, some basic margins, which is kind of the overall story of your ratio of revenue and expense. So we will be looking at the operating margin, which is your operating expense. Uh, compared to your operating revenue, the operating EBITDA, which makes some adjustments um, for um, uh, amortization and depreciation uh, and tax and kind of gives a more um, holistic sense of that margin. And then the total margin, which um, is one of the, those that's a little bit difficult to interpret sometimes for hospitals, but is an important one to keep our eye on, and especially as um, those investment losses are bringing down total margins, or at least did in 22. Um, days cash on hand, um, that's one you saw is, is looking pretty scary for a lot of our hospitals, but that um, is essentially just a measure of given the current expenses, how many days they could fulfill those with the available cash they have today. So that's a solvency measure. Um, that's that's uh, important to kind of see how, how far, how one's eye level compares to water. Um, debt service coverage ratio is like, okay, we know we have certain payments that we owe for principal and interest on um, existing debt. Um, can we cover that? This is one that's commonly used in debt covenants. And if it hasn't already been breached for our hospitals, it's at high risk of being breached. Um, so that that's one where um, that's that's another concerning sign about financial health. Um, and relatedly, uh, we're adding long-term debt to capitalization ratios um, because that's um, kind of also likely to swing. That's into kind of indicating how likely or how the relative kind of uh, choice between financing and uh, lending to try to keep up with capital improvement. We have a lot of deferred maintenance out there, so I wouldn't be surprised to see some major swings on that one uh, for fiscal year 24. Um, and then the average age of plant is just kind of, again, getting a sense of like how old um, the infrastructure that our hospitals are, are using is. And that's one that we also have on cost reports. We can also see how we look relative to other markets. So I think that, you know, like I said, there's many other measures staff will certainly look at, but I think this will help encapsulate kind of the headline for um, board review. Um, as far as the known pricing changes for Medicare and Medicaid, um, we will certainly monitor um, this information, uh, keep things as current and up to date as possible. Um, we are all but guaranteed that Medicare will release some proposed and final rules in the process um, between when budgets are submitted and when they are approved. Um, those changes can be material um, in Calmer times, there hasn't been a lot of variation between a proposed rule and final rule, but in recent years, a lot of the kind of 11th hour hand wringing has to do with congr uh, congressional decisions at the federal level. Um, so some institute, uh, some measures that were put in place to help keep hospitals whole during COVID are starting to expire. And so if they, they have to take action to kind of not make that happen. So all that to say, I think that um, proposed, proposed rules are tricky to apply in a budget adjustment and that uh, staff would suggest considering sticking with those final rules. We'll certainly also be monitoring uh, state appropriations and any impact that that might have on Vermont Medicaid reimbursement, whether it be um, through claims, DISH, other kind of sources that they might provide um, funding. So again, it's a factor, and I think that this factor makes the most sense to consider vis-a-vis -vis the commercial price assumptions. Um, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, that's the way it's written in statute right now, is that we are obligated to kind of look at the Medicaid expenditure and making sure that um, everything's kind of been done to defer um, increases to commercial uh, payers. Uh, hearings and deliberations. Um, so staff recommend that instead of requiring hospitals to prepare presentations, that the GMCB staff would lead the board through a standard process to review proposed budgets and their accompanying narratives. Um, to be clear, hospitals and the HCA would be there with the board um, and the, you know everyone would be participating to ask questions, provide clarification, engage in discussion during the review. But the idea would be kind of like a more focused factor-based kind of uh, setup. 
Uh, we also would suggest that hearings be no more than two hours per hospital. And that um, if there is need for kind of clarification or responsive exhibits that um, GMCB and the HTA would provide those questions in advance and then allow them a chance to provide those materials so that no one's um, scrambling uh, to provide information uh, that might be helpful to make a decision in that moment. Um, so that's quite a bit different. Uh, I know that uh, presentations, uh, it, it's mixed. Some hospitals really appreciate the opportunity to tell their own story. Others, I think, will find this a massive relief to not have to prepare these things. So, um, but I think for me, um, it's like, if we can systematically remo remove things things the same way, you know, that can help, I think, um, keep us focused. That's all. <laughs> uh Oops, um, so here is that proposed schedule. So uh, we still have to, uh, the August 11th date we had initially proposed is, is not gonna be possible. So we're kind of looking for uh, an additional date to sne sneak in there, but uh, this is all subject to change. But right now we would recommend starting with a staff overview on Wednesday, August 9th, and then kind of have these slots for hospital presentations. Um, you know, there'd be a kind of uh, relatively smaller slot for uh, let maybe a potentially uh, more straightforward hospital in the mornings with longer slots uh, available other times in the day. Uh, we have time for deliberations as needed um, so that we can get those decisions completed by uh, September 15th. All right, um, do we, are we interested in a recess or anything before we walk through the guidance or is this a good time to, it's just a little dry, so I don't know if people need a little bio break or anything. Um, I think we can keep going unless anyone makes uh, an indication otherwise. Why don't, why don't we keep going? Or, you know, Sarah, okay. why don't we go till 1130 and we'll just take a quick little break at 1130. Okay, sounds great. Um, all right, so I... All right. Are you seeing guidance? All right, great. Here it is. Uh, Times New Roman. Apparently, people feel strongly about that. So, um, <laughs> uh, so here's again that timeline subject to change. Um, so March 31st uh, is when we have this due. Uh, thank you to the industry for accommodating a little bit of a tweak to the submission date. So um, we're going to ask for it on June 30th. Um, it's traditionally due July 1st. That's a Saturday. If we had gone with the next business day, that would have been July 3rd. And with the 4th being a holiday, it just wasn't going to be a good scene. So we appreciate the flexibility and getting those in a bit early. Um, so then uh, staff are going to be developing all our good stuff uh, in that July to August time frame. Uh, you can expect staff analysis before hearings start this year. We'll have binders to you, um, probably right in the middle of rate review hearings that you won't be ready to look at, but they'll be there. <laughs> um, and we'll be touch base with all that kind of logistic stuff. Um, we do ask for those capital expender sheet, expenditure sheets to be updated and adaptive by August 1st. And then again, we launch on uh, August 9th at this point is what we're thinking. Um, and those orders are due to the hospitals on October 1st. So we have kind of that time between August 9th and the 15th to hear from hospitals and make the decisions. Um, so just uh, at a high level, this is just, you know, reminding everyone that this is um, a, a bridge year. Um, the second paragraph feels important to me, like just being clear that this is designed to further focus our process, um, communicate uh, changes that we're um, planning and how we approach uh, assessing hospital performance and really providing an opportunity to engage in some foundational conversations that I don't think we've really had a chance to have before. Um, and what we're looking to do through all of this is develop measures supported by evidence so that we can strengthen our regulatory approach. So. Um, that really is the goal here. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, it, these are very complex times and problems, and I think it's going to require a lot of creativity across the spectrum. And so um, I, I think these could be really constructive conversations. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we will be executing our statutory duties. So a lot of section sites that probably mean something more to other folks than I, um, but uh, that's that's in top encapsulating what our duties are, but making it clear that, you know, testimony and public comment are certainly part of um, what the board will consider. 
Um, so notable changes is that we're taking, uh, instead of using kind of the budget to budget approach, as you saw some of the drawbacks in very crazy times, it's very difficult to budget, is that we're recommending kind of starting with uh, fiscal year 22 actuals as a reference point. Um, we know that the um, there might be adjustments to that base that are appropriate to make them more appropriate to trend forward to fiscal year 24, such as provider transfers, or if there's, you know, kind of other material changes. So, you know, that should be addressed in the narrative, um, but we would fully expect those adjustments to be needed. Um, and then, this is assuming uh, that if you are voting to uh, extend the benchmark from fiscal year 23, uh, that would be an 8.6% growth rate um, over, um, and that'll be covered later, but essentially uh, it incorporates the, the 23 guidance there. Um, just a note that you know we're going to be refining everything, but any technical refinement would not be designed to alter its intended use. It's just to make sure we're getting things as right as we can. So um, you know that would be socialized with everyone. We'll be completely transparent in our methodology. Um, we also are making some um, updates to the accompanying material. So the uniform reporting manual will now actually just be definitions of terms and uh, making sure that we're collecting things uh, in a systematic way. Um, and instead, the kind of step by step um, of filing will be in the adaptive user guide. Uh, we are in the process of making some enhancements to adaptive that are really exciting and I think will help reduce um, some of the unnecessary burden that um, that particular platform has caused. So excited about that. Um, and then we will also have an Excel workbook that just has the data um, that as we're using it um, so that it anyone any, any anyone can actually use it themselves. Uh, but due to the kind of uh, tweaks, uh, we're going to provide these all in their final form by May 5th. Um, it sounds like that shouldn't be too disruptive to workflow. Um, and we will be spending May kind of doing trainings to make sure people are comfortable with the changes and uh, understand what we're trying to do. A reminder that the HCA by law is uh, incorporated in all these processes. Um, and then here um, are the policies uh, related to budget enforcement as well as amendments. So we have an enforcement policy. That's one that um, I think we're going to be uh, revising, but uh, because that uh, we didn't want to revise it just a little, knowing that it's going to need a lot more revision. So uh, we're keeping that largely intact. And then uh, the amendment and adjustment policy um, is also largely the same. Uh, there's a little new blurb here about requests for confidentiality. Um, this is a uh, pretty standard operating procedure for rate review. It's um, not historically been uh, used by hospitals, but just so you know, there is a process to request that some materials are maybe requested to be treated confidentially. Um, it just needs to make sure that it complies with the um, Vermont uh, Public Records Act. Um, so here's a very low uh, <laughs> enhancement, but just a filing checklist, making sure everyone's aware of what exhibits we're expecting and when. So note that there is a new addition here for a data collection period for the first two weeks of May uh, related to the wait time measure uh, that has been asked. So I know some hospitals missed that last year, so trying to make sure that's uh, obvious. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, eliminated um, some exhibits. The narrative has been uh, shorter than it's been in recent years. And then we are going to make a few tweaks uh, to a couple exhibits. Um, feedback on the payer revenue exhibit is it's um, it, it's really how we think about it, but not the way that it actually seems to work in real life. So just trying to accommodate that um, and figure out how we can get the information we need and be uh, accountable to the way the world actually works. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so that should also be um, helpful in terms of efficiency in this process. Um, so here, so again, this is presupposing some motions. So it's just a draft, but um, here's where we have our our kind of budgeted our budget guidelines and benchmarks. Uh, so first is that we'll kind of be officially providing a, a review of re for regulatory compliance. So our um, exhibits filed on time and completely. So is all are all the questions answered? Um, we will let you know uh, who is uh, you know meets this bar, gets the green check mark, and those who uh, did not uh, or needed 
some more help to get there. Um, so we'll be providing that. We also will be looking at kind of historical budgets for everybody, like how well have they performed um, in terms of uh, closeness to actuals and, you know, are there any, uh, you know, overall expense and revenue growth on a long, longer time period. Um, so then the benchmark here, again, it's um, incorporated through the 23 guidance, and that's 8.6% um, from fiscal year 22 actuals to the 24 budgets. Um, and uh, there is an important, um, I just want to make sure it's here. Yeah, so staff will review every budget to for the factors, make sure everything looks reasonable. If that's true and the budget is under the 8.6 benchmark, I promise you staff are going to recommend that budget is approved without alteration. <laughs> the board will still have a decision to make, but we will be recommending that budget is approved without um, any adjustment. Um, just want to make sure that's clear in the guidance. Um, I hope it's also clear that um, the board uh, understands that not all submissions will be under 8.6%. And in those cases, the expense factors will be reviewed, um, including the commercial price factor. Um, and that's where kind of um, the hospital is to kind of help us understand the need for the additional NPR. Um, so, and then kind of a vague, uh, not vague, but that's uh, for the commercial rate increase, just making it clear we'll also be reviewing those and may request adjustments to commercial rate increases. So the factors that we've outlined um, and some data sources that staff have identified as uh, relevant. Um, so for labor expense, it's the um, per FTE growth in salary and benefits from the base uh, of 22 to the budget in 24. Um, just as a comparison, we'll look at the U.S. Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics Employment Cost Index um, to see how that's been performing. Um, and to the earlier conversation, um, we want to hear about those contractual labor expenses and kind of understand um, how those are being uh, approached in the 24 budgets. Uh, utilization. Um, so we kind of talked about how wild and crazy some of those numbers can be but um essentially just looking for hospitals they've got the best uh information on this so looking at um their previous submissions um and some other places we can kind of check to see um that things are performing uh as indicated in the narrative so we can look at hospital discharge records through the hospital discharge data set the patient migration report so where are people going to care are we seeing any changes in patient care patterns Demographic changes, um, so, you know, that's the aging of the population and movement. Um, that'll be from the census. Um, and then wait time information, uh, which will be in uh, submitted in the narrative. So the idea being that if you have uh, high expectations to increase utilization and it looks like you've got um, people waiting for appointments, then that, that makes a lot more sense. Um, we also might uh, be looking at that to kind of um, look at relative utilization and market share um, across the system. Um, so for pharmaceutical expense, um, there's no like perfect uh, indicator for kind of the hospitals uh, purchasing costs here, but the for to truly get the effect on cost, we're recommending this commodity index for prescription drugs, uh, which does include drugs manufactured that are largely administered in hospital settings. Um, this is designed to isolate the price change <laughs> associated with these pharmaceuticals. There may be other increases or changes, could be decreases uh, related to volume uh, or the types of uh, pharmaceuticals. Those should be, you know, isolated separately. This is just designed to look at price. Uh, cost inflation, similarly, we're talking about price increases if you need more stuff or fancier stuff or you know different stuff that that's a little bit different exercise than the cost of the current stuff <laughs> um so the producer price index for general medical and surgical hospitals um, was recommended to the board and we concur we also will be kind of looking at some of um, relative performance on uh cost uh, relative cost performance um as much as we can gather from cost reports and here, um, I think this is a little bit hard to interpret, but essentially we're saying um, there will be um, five different peer groups identified to compare Vermont hospitals to. 
Um, the University of Vermont uh, Medical Center will actually have two different comparison groups, one uh, among academic medical centers and one among community medical centers uh, for communities similar to Burlington uh, or Chittenden County, I should say. Um, we're just uh, finding that uh, they, that uh, it's just hard to find a comparator for UVM, not just in Vermont. And so we're just trying to get the full picture of them as both kind of a community hospital and an academic medical center. Uh, mid sized community hospitals for Vermont hospitals at uh, Rutland and Central Vermont will be in that peer group. Small rural hospitals, Southwestern, Northwestern, and Brattleboro, and then our critical access hospitals. That's the one that's often the hardest um, to kind of uh, find the signal. Um, critical access hospitals look all sorts of different ways. So um, we, you know, that's an area where that technical refinement um, might come into play and we might end up thinking if there's more than one group here at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, so we'll be limited to information on cost reports. It's backward facing, but um, we'll look at volume, costs per discharge, staffing levels, case mix, payer mix, quality, financial metrics. Um, also be looking at salary allocations between clinical and administrative FTEs. Um, we will develop these lists of hospitals, um, but it's I hope it's clear here that we're happy to add hospitals upon request. Um, we'll be using, you know, measures of position, median and percentiles. So um, always happy to add, um, but not going to take away comparators. Um, and then uh, other relevant analyses. So uh, we uh, expect to have Burns and Associates update their recosting and uh, repricing of claims from our APCD just to look at cost uh, and payment variation as well as cost coverage variation. That will also be a part of me analysis that might be helpful as we assess the commercial price change. Um, all other relative price um, and variation sources uh, that we may consider include the relative pricing project conducted by RAND, the Yale Healthcare Pricing Project, and our own reimbursement variation report. Um, we also will consider previously approved changes in charge and or effective commercial rates by the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, financial indicators, I think we just went over those. That's just um, talking about those. Um, one note here is that um, uh, you know, this might be assessed at both the hospital and the consolidated level. I think we need to think through um, more systematically toward 25 about how we want to think about that. Um, but I think for now, just getting a sense of how they might look different at those two levels is really important. Um, as we said, we'll monitor those known pricing changes. Um, uncompensated care. So we're going to review the assumptions. Um, and, you know, Vermont Medicaid actually has a pretty sophisticated unwinding plan um, on their website right now. So if hospitals haven't already looked at that, they should consider um, looking at that as they consider how this might affect their um, bottom line. Um, we also have uh, a list of other factors. So, um, you know, there may be other publicly available data sources that we think would be helpful to understand trends or other factors identified by hospitals. So ones that have come up. Dartmouth Atlas of Care, the total cost of care as measured by the all payer model. Um, some measures of potentially avoidable utilization. Notably, there's a rural health dashboard that Mathematica put out. Um, but the intent would be to supplement our understanding um, and, uh, uh, you know, you know, as needed, I think, I guess. Uh, there's also a clause here about other productivity and efficiency indicators. Some of these, I think, were identified again above. Um, and then uh, the board's review process will re promote the general good of Vermont as set forth in 18 BSA 9372. It will be consistent with the principles for healthcare reform in 18 BSA 9371, as required by 18 BSA 9375A and B7. We will conclude considerations to to the extent to which a hospital's budget advances the principles that all Vermonters must receive affordable and appropriate health care at the appropriate time in the appropriate setting. The principle that the overall health cost uh, health care cost coverages must be contained and growth in health care spending in Vermont must balance the health care needs of the population with the ability to pay for such care and will adhere to the hospital budget review requirements, including that a budget shall promote efficient and economic operation of the hospital. Um, the board may review and consider other relevant factors proposed during the budget review process. Um, so then 
additional filings. I've still got 10 minutes. I think we can get through this. So uh, the main one here is the narrative. Um, so this is um, this is going to maybe have more focus than in previous years if we're not doing a presentation in addition to us. So this will be the meat of the record um, that the board will be using for its decision making uh, coming from the hospital. So uh, want to encourage, um, you know, the hospitals to be succinct and focused, um, but not feel constrained with the need to tell their story here. So, um, but yeah, for an executive summary, you know, hopefully keep those to a page, but um, making sure that we get the, the, you know, elevator pitch about the budget. Um, this is also a place where, um, you know, they should highlight any adjustments to the base um, and also um, kind of think about that consolidated versus individual hospital look for cases where that might be material. Um, so the questions, uh, question, the first question, just what what adjustments are you making to your base? Uh, the second question is, hey, how did these factors go into your budget? What were your assumptions? Um, outline those for that. Um, I've just included um, the eight um, factors that we've outlined, but make hope uh, also say that hospitals should include other material factors. Like that, this isn't meant to be exhaustive, so they might have other important components of their story to tell here. Um, give them a chance to summarize their known budget risks. So budgets are guesses. Um, they often involve cost saving targets. So um, just hospitals, the more that you can communicate that in um, like the magnitude of dollars um, in the kind of categories of expenditures, that just makes our job easier as we consider um, the risk already embedded in a budget. Um, we would like a org chart, um, just understanding the corporate structure of all our hospitals. I think this um, maybe has only been asked occasionally of a few hospitals. I think it'd be good to have that um, as a matter of course. Uh, we're repeating the wait time or the um, referral and visit lag question from um, last year. Uh, we're asking to do that the first two weeks of May of 2023 for each hospital and primary and specialty care practice, as well as the top five most frequent imaging procedures. Um, for those who are unable to produce the referral leg or visit leg metrics, we're just asking what's preventing it and when they will be able to report them and getting that third next available for those scenarios. Um, statutory requirement for the known depreciation schedules. Um, curious about any planned expenditures related to cybersecurity. Um, and then here is where um, we're trying to quantify um, the costs of that uncompensated care um, for the inability to transfer patients to post-acute or other more appropriate care settings. Um, so asking them to kind of give a sense of the magnitude of that and um, proportionally how much of that is related to folks with a primary diagnosis related to mental health. So starting to get some more kind of um, information on those um, critical issues. Um, asking for uh, net revenue above cost on pharmaceuticals and um, hoping to hear some um, get more understanding about how those funds are flowing through systems. Um, and then uh, we did get some comment about this uh, question related to facility fees. Um, so I believe that this definition of a facility fee is not necessarily a standard one. So we might want to consider uh, how we want to handle that, making sure that we're getting the answer to the question we need to ask. Um, a set of questions related to uh, patient financial assistance. There's efforts underway to standardize free care policies. Um, so that some of that's material to that. Um, and then administrative costs. So some of this is captured on 990s, but there's thresholds uh, to report there. And this is to make it in a little bit easier way to digest. Um, and then the only but the goodies, uh, most recent 990 and uh, community health needs assessments to be submitted. Um, note that th this is being requested by June 30th. That seemed to be closer to historical timelines, um, but that is that's all she wrote on that one. So um, yeah, it might be a good time to take a break before we move on, unless there's any uh, kind of clarifying questions we should address first. Um, why don't we go ahead and take a break? Um, we'll come back at uh, 1130. And uh, I believe a couple of board members have 12 o'clock meetings, so we'll go 1130 to 12. Thank you. OK, it looks like everyone's back, so we can call the meeting back to order. Um, Sarah, please continue.
Okay, um, so we won't have time probably to do any um, motions this morning, uh, but uh, I'll go through kind of the four uh, motions we're recommending, uh, kind of answer questions, have you think about it over lunch and hopefully vote this afternoon. So uh, the basically four different categories, the benchmark, uh, the factors, the budget policies, and overall guidance. Um, so the decision point on the fiscal year 23 guidance established a two-year growth rate in net patient service revenue, fixed perspective payments and reserves, which I call NPR because I'm lazy. Um, but looking at that to grow from 8.6% from fiscal year 22 to 24, uh, we do recommend extending the practice um, from the 23 budget review of using actuals in place of budgets. Um, the 23 order technically says growth over the budgets. Um, and, and I think as we already flagged, um, we we think that this target is extremely ambitious and that many hospitals may have difficulty achieving it. Um, you know, it, it may be, it, it certainly seems possible for some of the regulated entities, but again, step, if uh, a budget comes in under this benchmark and uh, is based on reasonable ex ex uh, assumptions, uh, staff will be recommending it be um, approved without modification. Um, it's my understanding that the board is expecting that not all uh, requests will necessarily be under that benchmark and that the request will still be considered using the factors outlined. So the suggested motion language, uh, thanks to Russ, move that for the fiscal year 24 hospital budget review process, the Reavon Care Board maintain the NPR growth guidance established last year of no more than an aggregated 8.6% NPR FPP growth over two years, but modified to measure growth from fiscal year 22 actuals to the 2024 budget. So that is for you to chew on. Um, we did get public comment kind of talking about how ambitious this is and um, Again, uh, so if expenses grew 10% more than budget last year, we, you know, not to say that'll continue, but if you're leaving the system growth of 0.1%, we know that, you know, inflationary growth is is almost certainly more than that. Um, so just knowing that the target is um, quite low compared to the approved budgets in 23 in some cases. Uh, so this is just summarizing the factors uh, outlined in the guidance and the related data sources um, that may be considered. Um, hopefully it goes without standing that Vermont law is uh, omnipresent in all of these decisions, so they, they would all, that would also be applied, but um, just trying to get a sense of the factors. So again, labor, utilization, pharmaceutical cost, cost inflation, commercial price, um, financial benchmarks, known pricing changes on compensated care and um, kind of other uh, data sources as needed. Um, again, that's not meant to be exhaustive of things that might affect a hospital budget, but these are some of our biggest drivers. And as we learned last time, you know, just labor, just <laughs> labor, pharmaceutical cost and medical supplies, you know, accounts for more than 80% of budgets right now. So, um, and historically more than 85%. So we're, we're getting a lot of kind of the expenditure categories uh, in these factors. Um, so here that says to move to approve the factors and related data sources identified in the hospital guidance uh, as presented by board staff, um, leaving a placeholder in case any modifications are identified. Um, <clears throat> incorporating the existing policy on hospital budget enforcement, um, as well as uh, the draft budget amendment and adjustment policy, which renews uh, a previous policy with a few tweaks, uh, not material really. And the motion there would be to approve those. <laughs> so that one's uh, maybe straightforward. We can walk through the policies if that would be helpful. Um, and then finally, just a move, uh, motion to approve the guidance in its totality with um, a little placeholder if there are modifications identified. All right, so that took a lot less than 30 minutes. I don't know if we wanna take some time for questions and make sure we can uh, address the, uh, anything you need uh, to think about this on your recess, but uh, here we are. Yeah, uh, since we have the time, why don't we keep moving along? Um, we'll, we'll go right up to 12 if that's okay, uh, maybe, maybe a couple minutes early, but why don't we start with board uh, member questions and comments. And um, member Holmes, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, and thank you, Sarah and team 
huge help. I know this is a big lift. Uh, and, you know, from that first slide or second slide that you put out there, it's one that's going to clearly continue as we move towards fiscal year 25. So I know this is a work in progress. Um, and I was actually really glad to hear about um, some of the streamlining and improvements in adaptive. I think that's going to be really helpful to the hospitals to reduce the burden and get the data that we need. Um, so I think, um, I mean, I'm happy to start talking about Chair Foster, do you want me to start talking about that first decision point, or is it more questions and comments at this point? Unreal. I mean, I'm not sure if we should start the process of moving toward making motions with respect to the, say, for example, the NPR benchmark. I think because of the time, it'd be best to just do any questions or comments now, and then after lunch, we can take up the, the motions okay. and any discussion we need on the motions after lunch. Okay, uh, I, then I just, I think I only have one process question, um, Sarah, which is about um, the movement away from having hospitals come and present. Um, and I'm just cu kind of curious, there was a slide up there that talked about there'd be questions that would be sent to the hospitals, but there also was an opportunity for board members to ask questions of the hospitals in the hearing. So I guess I'm just curious, is the process that we would Look through the uh, the book, the binders that we're getting, the analysis. Submit questions to you prior to the hearings that would go out to the hospitals, but there would also be an opportunity for follow up questions in the board hearing for board members to make. I'm just trying to figure out where where we're making questions, the timing of our questions, whether we'll have opportunities both in written and in the hearing itself for questions. Yeah, that's the vision is to um, both uh, provide written questions in advance, particularly those that might have a heavier um, lift to answer, <laughs> uh, and then also having the opportunity to answer and discuss things uh, when the hospitals are here. Um, and I think like the the mechanics of that whole process, um, we can likely sort out. I think the main pressure right now is uh, getting some dates certain so people can start scheduling. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. I would just say that given you, you did make the comment about uh, the, the binders may be arriving on our desks at the time of rate review. So yeah. I'm also just recognizing our ability to, to, to do both simultaneously may be tough. So when we get those binders and how we do that will be important for the timing for us to be able to ask questions. So, um, okay, that was my, my sort of process question. Uh, I will just, I think I'll talk more about my other comments after lunch. Member Lunch? Yes, thank you, Sarah and team. Uh, this is a terrific amount of work and really appreciate it. Um, I I had one question related to the facility fee question because the definition used in the draft doesn't is not the standard Medicare facility fee definition. And so I think that could create confusion. So I'm trying to understand the purpose behind the question and what uh, we're hoping to get from it. Um, and happy to help on maybe wordsmithing that term. Maybe we can come up with a different term, um, but it would be helpful to understand the why or why. What, are, what information are we trying to get? Yep. Um, okay, I'm happy to take that as a uh, action on the recess uh, to propose kind of a, a new draft of how to uh, kind of clean that up a little bit. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm happy to do that in real time as we talk, but I need to understand the why, which, yeah, so if, my if yeah. And I, uh, this one uh, is courtesy of the healthcare advocate. I know they get a lot of uh, questions from consumers related to this. Um, I do think that uh, the the effect that this has might be due to more than one thing. So I, I agree, I wanna make sure that we are understanding exactly what we're trying to get at and, and ask the question uh, to make sure that's what we're getting. <laughs> yeah, and maybe I don't wanna put the HCA on the spot or you know ask them out of order, obviously, but it would be helpful maybe for, for them to speak to it directly if that's okay with Chair Foster. And it doesn't have to be now, it could be after the recess if that makes sense. Eric, if you have the Mr. Schultz, you'd like to go ahead. That's that's fine. Yeah. I see, I see so I I will um, reach out to Sam to talk with you, Sarah. And if there's still uh, questions, Robin, um, 
I know uh, Sam is covering the afternoon meeting, and so I will ask him to prepare for that. Um, yeah, if that makes the most sense, I think for us. Yeah, I think it's just a term of art in Medicare billing is getting everybody's wires crossed. So uh, we can we can make sure we're getting yeah, and right. I think it makes sense. Like I had, um, yeah, I mean we it's definitely not the Medicare billing. It's something very specific that comes from consumer complaints and a some I think health affairs articles. So I think it it's a good point um, that it needs wordsmithing because it suggests something that doesn't really isn't as clear as possible given overlap with language. Thank you. Um, that was really my only question other, um, or comment at this point. Great, thanks. Um, Member Walsh. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Sarah and team uh, for the presentation. Um, one, we heard from throughout the actuals and through the guidance, um, inflationary pressure. And I realize that we're talking about hospital budgets. We're talking about what affects that budget and the inflationary pressures that hospitals have to deal with. Um, but I also think it would be helpful for us to have some, on our part, some assessment of hospital price inflation through the same period. I know um, from some of prior work that we have reviewed um, from the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, hospital price inflation has been um, more than triple overall inflation, more than double wage inflation, and more than double for um, other service things like childhood, um, child care services. So some context around the inflation measures would be helpful. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to, to, as everybody has, thank you for your review of the process. We've been doing this, the board's been doing it for more than a decade. Um, and during that time, we've had a pandemic. We've had an affordability crisis. Um, we have access backlogs suggesting the system is full, but we also have declining hospital financials. So something's not working and revising our review of the system seems um, good. And what we're undertaken so far, you've greatly expanded our ability to assess and benchmark how hospitals are allocating their revenue. You built a statistical model, and I don't know that we really appreciated this last week, that's based on an analysis of expenditures. And that outperformed or more closely predicted actuals over the past three years um, than any other way of assessing that we looked at. So the model really works, appears to work well. Um, but these steps are new. They'll give us um, a more accurate understanding of hospital budgets and help us forecast needs. Um, they're new, so for consistency, it makes sense that we keep some of what we have been doing while we add in the new and continue to build it. Um, so I, just, I think you and the staff have just done a really super job and I appreciate that. So thank you. Dr. Merman. Um, I think some of my comments are probably more appropriate for, for this afternoon, but um but yes thank i mean like everyone else and i actually am in the office so i just popped it and said uh thank you so much and all this so um so we can continue to do what tom was talking about and and through the process of continual improvement try to improve what we do so um i guess there's two things that i wanted to bring up that may just be 2025 issues and not 2024 issues um, but affordability is this elusive concept that we can't seem to figure out a clear definition of. But one thing I think would be um, potentially appropriate to look at with regards to affordability is that when a potential rate increase is requested, that we somehow could see what that would do to 
uh, an average commercial pay or uh, in family. Now I know that's like super complicated because there's not a one to one, and um, and these would be aggregates. But I do still think maybe an aggregate uh, assessment of that might give us an idea when we look at a three percent rate increase for one hospital, what that's going to just cost the average Vermonter at that time. But, you know it it. It's still just a, a part of what all 14 hospitals would cost, but I think it, it might be helpful. I mean, I think we're up 68% uh, increase in charges from 2013 to 2023. And I, I believe inflation was like 29% and CPI was 31% during that time. So, so insurance is increasing. Somehow I got muted. So insurance prices are increasing at increasing rates. So, uh, that's just one thing I think might help us understand affordability. Um, and the other thing that I think we may not need to wait till 2025 on is some sketch of equity indices. There, I mean, there are, there's the loam uh, data on equity. Um, and to start start looking at that again, it, you know, I, I appreciate that 8.6% is going to be a very, very challenging, if not impossible target for a lot of hospitals and that and I appreciate the idea that of using expense growth when evaluating, kind of moving to the next view of how to consider hospital budgets in that above 8.6% group. But I, I think so, but I do think kind of having a lens of equity and affordability and that eight per, above 8.6% group would be helpful. Um, yes, so that's what my thoughts are this far, but uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that this NPR growth cap from the 23 guidance, um, the way you've structured this allows for flexibility, right? So it is an ambitious target. Like there's no denying that for where the hospitals are today, it will be difficult for many to achieve. Um, but that's when we then go into all those other factors that we can look at for the expense growth and we can look to the hospital narratives and explanation for the need. And I really like the comparison data to understand how our hospitals are doing versus others, right? I think our hospitals do an excellent job of a lot of things and we want to see that and we want to uh, applaud where they do well and we want to recognize where there's room for improvement and where we can achieve uh, at a higher level, right? So I think this will start giving us that ability, and I really thank you guys for for putting this together and making it like this because I think it's a, a good step. Um, like Dr. Merman, I agree, consumer affordability and the productivity and the equity issues are really important for 25. I know we're not there today, but those will be really important because an unaffordable system is not an accessible system. An unaffordable system is not a sustainable system. And a sustainable an in, a system that's not sustainable is really bad too, right? So these things all are the conundrum of what we all do. And having that fuller picture in this process is really critical. Um, so I'm really glad that we're going here. I have nothing else but thanks and gratitude for you and your team and Russ, so thank you. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Nothing for me, and I thanks to Eric for stepping in. I mistakenly thought we were coming back at noon, um, but I know there was a question around facility fees, and um, yeah, we can get some more information to you about that. So thank you. Um, I, great. I just, oh, sorry. I just wanted to add in quickly, hearing what Dr. Merman said. I think, um, you know, we might be in a situation that it might be useful to look at various scenarios, kind of like you know, as if you were in a statistical model and you were talking about it and you plugged in certain variables to talk about a like prototypical person. But in this case, you're not going to have a statistical model. So you're kind of drawing on from kind of scenario planning and urban planning. And that may be the closest we can get because of the variance in folks um, health insurance status. So like an aggregate may not be you meaningful in this context because it's you know it's garbage in right so that's something i think you know with united states of care and sarah um that's something that i'm kind of putting on our radar and i will say you know the level of rigor that's brought to this now is 
wonderful. And, uh, you know, I've told Sarah, she is one of the people who makes me happy that I pay state taxes. So that, that that's my opinion. Great. Um, and we will turn it to public comment via the raise your hand function. Okay, uh, seeing none, um, we will adjourn or put this meeting in recess rather, and um, we'll come back. Does what o'clock work for everyone's schedule or do we need a little extra time built in? Okay. We will be back at one o'clock um, and we are in recess. Thank you. We'll call the meeting back to order uh, and continue. And what we're going to do is we're going to take up the um, discussion on the hospital facility fees. And we had gone through um, the uh, presentation a little quicker than I think people had anticipated. So I'm going to give it another opportunity for um, any healthcare advocate comment or public comment after we do the facility fee issue. Um, okay, Sarah, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful. Um, so we have a new question here drafted. Um, I hopefully you can see my screen here. Uh, looks like I'm freezing. Great. <laughs> All right, am I back? Can you see stuff? I just froze for a stressful few seconds. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we've uh, so we uh, have reframed this, hopefully in making it clear uh, the intent of the question. So does your institution charge facility fees to patients who access your emergency department? Facility fees have been defined as the cost of walking in the door that are billed separately to cover overhead and other costs to provide care in addition uh, to the charges for specific services received by the patient. If your institution charges facility fees, provide an estimate of the total sum of facility fees based uh, billed and collected. So it sounds like this is specifically related to ED uh, utilization cases, um, which is the issue um, that consumers are calling the advocate about. Uh, so uh, I think that hopefully adds clarity and um, makes it clear uh, what the HCA is trying to get there. And these should include then the Medicare facility fees because the Medicare facility fees are separately charged from professional services to cover overhead and other costs. Yeah. So that so we are looking to get Medicare facility fees in answer to this question. That might be a pair that uses this billing methodology, yes. Yeah, Medicare for sure. And uh, yeah, Medicare Advantage, it's mixed. Uh, I think from my understanding, commercial payers by and large are moving away from that. Um, and I believe that Medicaid did away with this billing approach a while ago. Yeah, by statute. Yeah. <clears throat> with Medicaid. Yep. Okay. So I think MVP still uses, uh, they still base on Medicare. So they would right, right. be captured, I think. I don't know of any other commercial payers that do that, although I could have gaps in my knowledge, certainly. So, okay. Great. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure we were focused on Medicare since that's largely, I think, what we'll get. Yep. There. Great. Um, so that was kind of that housekeeping issue. Um, and I think uh, if it pleases the board, I'm happy to pull the draft motion language back up. That'd be great. I, I will open it up um, uh, for any public comment on this or um, the broader guidance that we discussed more thoroughly this morning. Um, Mr. Del Treco, your hand was up. It, yes. and, 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 and it still is. I apologize. Great. I raised it very fa fast and lowered it very fast. Um, so uh, I just think I know I popped in on the facility fee conversation a little bit late. Um, um, uh, by walking through the door, um, you know, this is a very technical conversation of facility fees. Um, there's uh, UB billing which is 
which is facility charges. There's 1,500 professional, and I don't want to complicate this, but when you walk through the door as a patient that walks into the emergency room, there's one of six CPT charges that are charged to your you on the UB, and that's a facility charge. You get that charge if you're Blue Cross, Blue Shield, MVP, Medicare, Medicaid, no matter what. Facility fees are a very defined uh, piece of business that doesn't, that I don't think is refre reflected uh, properly here. And it's, and, and oh, by the way, it's very complex. Um, and, and I think we just need to be very careful of what we're asking for, for because a facility fee is every one, almost every one of those gross charges that you evaluate in your budgets. Um, so we, we, we need to understand what we're trying to get after here. And I'm not so sure that this conversation to accomplish that. Yeah, I think that that's one of the, to your point, complexities is that um, in cases where there is um, a facility fee associated with service, uh, the professional charge is reduced accordingly. And so um, it, it, I understand that it's a driver um, that, uh, and there's some research uh, cited in the question to kind of help uh, hopefully guide uh, where people are trying to get that information. Um, from my understanding, uh, these uh, portions of the bill um, might not be covered uh, for a lot of the folks calling the HCA, and so it's causing a lot of um, financial hardship. And so just getting a sense of how these are growing. Um, it, it, it's a very complex topic, and uh, I, I appreciate the hospitals doing their best to uh, provide a little insight, but I do think that that will probably end up with more questions than answers, um, like a lot of these <laughs> thorny issues. Uh, Mr. Del Tacro, please, please go ahead. And, and thank you for um, allowing me to speak again, and it's not directly public comment, but it, it's once again my offer to the HCA to evaluate what is happening in this space, work with our CFOs where necessary, and um, frankly, not make this a very complicated conversation within the budget context, because um, I don't, if you ask this twice, you'll get five different answers on what it means. Um, so um, thank you very much. Is there any other? public comment at this time before the board um, moves to the staff recommended motions. Okay, great. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Paish, please go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you. And I, yeah, I think this is an important conversation and thanks Mr. Del Treco for your comment. I mean, I think it won't, I think it's an important question and I think it's a yes and. Um, I think that we can definitely, through the process, work to understand how to best answer that question. Um, just to briefly kind of provide a little bit more context on why we're asking it. As Sarah outlined, we do get calls from people, and I, I mean, it's not uncommon that a facility fee is something that people are unfamiliar with, and it's often cases where consumers have called the hospital or called their insurer, and they've been told that it's not covered. So they expect a ER cost or a bill of like $200 and it's often, you know, a thousand or $2,000. Um, the Kaiser piece, which I encourage all folks to to read, which is cited in the, in the guidance, it really documents how facility fees have been rapidly increasing over time, um, a fourfold increase in the last 15 years. And Within that, there's actually no real national standardization around how facility fees are calculated or how they're derived, which is unlike professional fees or other fees that um, are familiar to the board. So that's it's a real area, um, I think, of it's a real gray area. It's a real black box, which is essentially why one of the many reasons why we think it's critical to get more accurate data on it. Um, and there's a lot of inherent limitations with any metric, but with the Medicare cost report, a lot of it derives on unaudited financials and accounting elements that are not incorporated in stronger audited financial statements. So we don't believe that it's necessarily a duplicative question. 
One, I mean, only a third of hospitals nationwide have actually reported facility fee data, despite being required by the feds through price transparency rules to report it. So we think it's an important question. I mean, happy to to talk more about how to best answer it, and so we can better understand the complexity that you talk about. Um, but we do think it's an important question to ask. Thanks. My goal would be to get those patients that you have questions get their questions answered. Um, so that's primary my goal. Okay, uh, is there any other public comment? Okay, uh, the staff has uh, suggested a motion and is any board member interested in making the motion? I'll go ahead and move that um, for the Fiscal year 2024 hospital budget review process, the Green Mountain Care Board maintained the net patient revenue fixed perspective payment growth guidance established last year of no more than an aggregated 8.6% NPR FPP growth over two years, but modified to measure the growth from fiscal year 22 actuals to fiscal year 24 budgeted NPR FPP. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Is there any um, board discussion on the motion? Since I made the motion, I'll just jump in. Sorry, Jess, did you want to go? I thought I might, since I made the motion, talk first. But um, I would say that the I last year when we were talking through the NPR guidance, um, there was a lot of discussion around how to account for the uncertainties of the pandemic. And so part of what I think the board was attempting to do with the guidance was to provide some certainty over a two year period. Um, and while I completely agree with uh, the prior statements that this seems ambitious and that many hospitals uh, will not be able to achieve it, it does provide us with a consistent and anticipated target with which to make the first cut um, for staff's recommendations in terms of approval versus a deeper dive into the uh, into the budget assumptions. So um, while I recognize that <clears throat> many hospitals won't be able to meet the target, I still think it's worthwhile to provide to maintain the certainty and consistency uh, from last year and to use this as uh, really a, a first, a way to take a first cut. So that's why I uh, proposed the motion. Thanks. Thank you, and Member Holmes? Yeah, I was just gonna, I mean, I guess say something similarly, um, you know, having a this 8.6% two-year benchmark, um, on the pro side, it's predictable. We we said this last year, and hospitals have requested more predictability and consistency. And many, I believe, liked the fact that it allowed for longer range plan planning to do a two year uh, benchmark. So that's the pro side. I think you know the predictability is on the pro side. I think on the con side, I I, I agree. We're in unpredictable times, and to some degree. Uh, I think many of our hospitals are not going to be able to achieve, um, you know, this 8.6%. And I think it'll be for legitimate reasons. Um, I think that, you know, there's still pent up demand from COVID that we're dealing with. There's higher acuity, uh, probably related also to uh, a COVID. And we know that there's demographic shifts related to population growth. So I, I just want to sort of echo my colleagues' comments there is that the board always reviews every budget and thoroughly and will continue to do so with this budget process um, and provide every opportunity for hospitals to explain why it's not possible to meet this target and review those submissions carefully to understand both the challenges that hospitals are facing and opportunities potentially. Uh, the statute requires us to set a benchmark, so this seems like a reasonable one to start with for that predictability rationale. For me, if hospitals are coming in under the 8.6% uh, and their budgets otherwise, the components of their budgets are deemed reasonable, then I support the, the staff's uh, projections that they will 
approve those budgets or recommend approve those budgets. I think that's reasonable. So for the other hospitals that don't meet this 8.6% benchmark over two years, we're just, we're gonna review them. That's what we're gonna do. So that I, I'm comfortable with this motion. Any other board discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, the motion uh, carries unanimously. Um, next motion. Um, I'll go ahead and make this motion. This relates to the factors that were identified that the board would review um, for hospitals that were um, having the full review that weren't able to hit the 8.6%. Um, and I move to approve the factors and related data sources identified in the hospital budget guidance as presented by board staff. Second. I'll second. Is there any board discussion of this motion? I just have one uh, comment to make. Uh, the factors looked right to me. I really like the comparative look at other hospitals. The data sources really thank you, Sarah and team, for identifying so many multifaceted uh, data sources for us to have a really good look, more data than we've ever had. Uh, there was one. Um, data source that I was actually thinking might be helpful to add to the, maybe in the other category. And this is if and when the AHS primary care wait time study becomes available. I think that would be really informative and it would be helpful to see uh, and think about in the context of hospital budgets and where the pain points are. Um, so I was just gonna suggest that that perhaps be added as we're looking at access and wait times and all of that, if that data becomes available available to add that to the other category. Yeah, I was unaware of that uh, pending deliverable, um, so I certainly can add that if there's support here. <laughs> Any other board comment or discussion on um, this motion or member Holmes's suggestion. Um, I'll go ahead and, and add that I support member Holmes's recommendation that if such data becomes available, that it be added to the factors. So are you, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Russ. Um, I, we might be saying the same thing. I um, just wanted to clarify that that was <clears throat> an amendment or ask if we're correct that that was an amendment to the motion. Friendly amendment? Or you know, to, to the degree that it's highlighted and says end with the modifications identified during this meeting, that's that could be the modification, right? Right, but I think procedurally <laughs> Owen has to say it was a friendly amendment and then the seconder of the emotion would have to agree or we could withdraw the motion and start again. Why don't we withdraw the motion? Actually, sorry, let me stop there. Did, is there any other board comment on member Holmes as recommendation? Other than I'm, mine, I'm supportive. I'm supportive. Supportive. Okay, great. I'll, I'll withdraw the motion and start again. Um, I move to approve the factors and related data sources identified in the hospital budget guidance as presented by board staff, and with the modifications modification identified during this meeting relating to the primary care provider wait times study. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, aye. And member, member, I'm sorry, I didn't hear aye. your response. Aye. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, the motion carries unanimously. The 
Ms. Lindbergh, could you pull up the next proposed motion language? Is there a motion? I'll move I'll we move. approve the. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Oh, please. <laughs> I move we approve the budget amendment and adjustments policy as presented by board staff. I'll second. Any board discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, and I believe we have one last motion, Ms. Lindbergh. And this motion relates to the entirety of the guidance with the modification we made um, earlier to the uh, uh, factors that we're evaluating. Um, I'll go ahead and move that for the fiscal year 2024 hospital budget review process, the Green Mountain Care Board approve and adopt the fiscal year 24 hospital budget guidance as presented by board staff and with the modifications identified during this meeting to be effective as of March 31st, 2023. Second. Is there any board discussion? I'll just chime in and say that I think that um, the guidance this year makes an important step forward in terms of modifying our process. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it further evolves for next year. Any other board discussion? Concur with member Lunge. Um, I feel the same way. And um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. Ms. Lindbergh and Mr. McCracken, thank you guys very, very much to you and your teams for all this work. This is a big effort, and I really appreciate all that went into it. So thank you. Hopefully, we won't see you till August. <laughs> <laughs> You deserve a little Not bit a of a chance. Break. You deserve a little bit of a break. Is there any um, old business to come before the board? Any new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.